Yeah, welcome to another episode of News of the Day. I'm Hugh Ross, an astrophysicist and the founder and senior scholar at Reasons to Believe. And now in this News of the Day, we report on breaking scientific discoveries that have a significant impact uh, for the Christian faith. And it seems like every month, uh, almost every week, a new scientific journal gets launched. And one I've just been appraised of is a journal called Air Bursts and Cratering Impacts. It's now in its second volume. And uh, this 31-page paper got published by 26 scientists literally just days ago. And uh, it was quite fascinating in what it says about why we have such extreme climate stability beginning 9,500 years ago and extending up to 1950. And I wrote in this book, Weathering Climate Change, that the key factor is something we now know as the younger, driest cooling event. And in the slide that you can see here, I basically demonstrate that instead of the global mean temperature rising to about two to two and a half degrees above where it is now, which is what you see in every ice age cycle. There's been 40 past ice age cycles. And consistently, the temperature has jumped up to about two to two and a half degrees above where it is now. We're living in the only ice age cycle where that has not happened. And the reason it hasn't happened is because of something called the Younger Dryas Cooling Event. It began 12,800 years ago, where the temperature plummeted uh, by about 12 degrees centigrade, more than 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And as that severe drop in temperature, and it lasted 1,200 years, that's what prevented the global mean temperature from rising to its normal two degrees above where it is now. And uh, it also stabilized the climate. And, uh, and that kept going until the natural cycles began to cool our planet. That started 8,700 years ago, uh, where uh, the t changing tilt in Earth's rotation axis, changing shape of Earth's orbit, uh, combined to begin to cool the planet. But because of the climate stability was launched as a result of the Younger Dryas cooling event, human activity and the growth of human population technology began to warm the planet. And the human warming effect almost perfectly balanced off the natural cooling effects and gave us this extended period, uh, more than 9,500 years, of extreme climate stability, unprecedented climate stability. And this is what really enabled the human population to multiply up into the billions and for us to develop uh, global high technology civilization. A key factor in making possible the spread of the gospel message to all the people groups of the world. Uh, but a big debate among scientists is what caused the Younger Dryas cooling event? And when I wrote the book Weathering Climate Change, I made reference to an asteroid that collided in northwest um, Greenland. And uh, you know, the third slide here basically shows you the location of that collision very in the northwest tip of uh, Greenland. And uh, the thinking was, you know, that would have melted ice and sent boulders all over North America and Siberia. And uh, this would have changed the outflow of uh, melt glacial meltwater coming out of Lake Agassiz. And the second slide basically shows you this enormous glacial melt, Lake Agassiz, that existed in the middle of North America, you know, 13 uh, to 18,000 years ago. And uh, how uh, the Younger Dryas was initiated uh, by not only a global cooling effect that lasted maybe a year or two, uh, but also how uh, that uh, whatever caused the Younger Dryas cooling event changed the flow of meltwater down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, and instead that got blocked, and now we had two flows, one going out through the St. Lawrence River, the other one going out through the Mackenzie River in the Arctic, and how the flow of that uh, melted ice began to cool the North Atlantic. And it was that dramatic cooling that allowed 1,200 years of global cooling to set in on planet Earth and eventually lead to this long period of extreme climate stability. Now, when I wrote Weathering Climate Change, I cited a research paper that came up with several scientific attempts 
the date uh, when that asteroid hit in northwestern Greenland. And uh, the dates are coming back at 12,800 years ago, the same date for the start of the Younger Dryas cooling event. And so it appeared at that time, this was back in 2020, uh, that we had an answer for what caused the Younger Dryas cooling event. About two years afterwards, a team of physicists actually applied argon-argon radiometric dating and uranium uh, lead uh, radiometric dating and said, hey, wait, uh, the dates we're getting for when this crater first formed is coming back at uh, about 57, yeah, 58 million years ago, plus or minus half a million years. And so there's, this has led to a big debate. How come some of the dating methods are coming in at 12,800 years ago, but these two radiometric tests are telling us that it's about 58 million years ago? Well, this paper basically has provided what I believe is the answer, and this could settle a long-standing debate, basically making the point uh, that uh, what they did is they looked at three sites on the eastern U.S. Uh, seaboard, one in New Jersey, one in Maryland, and one in South Carolina. And they discovered at these three sites uh, beds that were buried of microspherals. Now, these are little tiny glassy balls, uh, and they're formed by intense heat and pressure, which is what you'd expect if there's some kind of extraterrestrial collision event. They also found melt glass. Uh, they also found uh, zircon crystals. Uh, they found uh, nano diamonds and combustion aerosols. And these are all indicators of an extraterrestrial impact event. And at all three sites, they found elevated amounts of platinum and iridium, way beyond what you see in uh, natural earth materials. Uh, but iridium and platinum are signatures uh, for a certain kind of comet or asteroid uh, collision event. And so they accumulated this evidence and they began to date the microspherals, the nano diamonds that they had found, and uh, they discovered that they're all coming in uh, at dates between 12,835 uh, years ago and 12,735 years ago. And then they looked at the latest literature on the beginning of the Younger Dryas cooling event and noted that they're getting the same year range uh, 12,835 to 12,735 uh, for the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling event. And so their claim in this 31-page paper is that indeed these nano diamonds, these combustion aerosols, uh, these melt glass, and these little tiny uh, circular spherical microspherals are all indicators that it, hey, indeed an impact is what caused the Younger Dryas cooling event. And that's something I documented in Weathering Climate Change, that the evidence is overwhelming that it was caused by some kind of impact event. But what's different here is they're saying, we don't think it was caused by an asteroid. And they make the point that the crater in northwest Greenland is too big. And they're saying, we think there's actually a good case that indeed an asteroid about 1.3 kilometers in diameter uh, hitting the Earth uh, 58 million years ago explains a crater. However, the dates that they were uh, made by a team that went into that area, they were basically measuring the tops of the crater and basically saying that could be from a separate uh, impact event. So they're saying, we believe both sets of dates are accurate that the 58 million year date is accurate. That's for an ancient asteroid that collided northwest of Greenland. Uh, but all the dates in the same region that are coming back at 12,800 years ago are also uh, not wrong. Uh, they're accurate. And this is a result of a second impact event. And here they're proposing that a comet struck the Earth and it was going through the atmosphere. Uh, it began to disintegrate. And this is typical for comets because comets are 85% frozen water. And so when they impact Earth's atmosphere, uh, the velocity going through the atmosphere generates a lot of heat, breaks up the comet into little bits and pieces, 
And basically they're saying that the broken up parts of this uh, comet as it came to the atmosphere and got down to very low elevations, uh, that's when they encountered more air pressure and more temperature, and this caused what's called an airburst effect. And uh, I think most of you watching are probably familiar with airburst effects because there's uh, two that have happened in Siberia in the last hundred years. And this is where a small comet comes through the atmosphere, breaks up, and basically causes an airburst, a shock wave that runs through uh, that part of Siberia. And there's actually photographs showing you how trees are knocked down. But the interesting point is you don't get a crater. What you get are forest fires, knock down trees, uh, because when you get a, a, a comet shattering in the very low elevation atmosphere of the Earth, it generates a very high pressure, high temperature shock wave. Now, in this case, these 26 scientists are claiming we're talking about a big comet coming through the atmosphere 12,800 years ago, shattering in the atmosphere and generating these low elevation air bursts all over North America, uh, parts of South America, over much of Europe, and even into the Middle East and South Africa because they cite 50 different locations, geographical locations in the Earth, where likewise they're finding these microspherals, these nanodiamonds, uh, these uh, uh, combustion aerosols, uh, and these melt glass, 50 different sites around the world that all date to 12,800 years ago. So they're basically claiming, we think what's happening is a comet goes through the atmosphere, disintegrates, into probably hundreds, if not thousands of pieces, and it causes these uh, air burst effects uh, all over uh, these parts of the world. Now, it wouldn't be a global effect. However, we do know that almost all of North America was impacted from Mexico through the U.S. and Canada, was deeply impacted. Greenland was impacted, uh, almost all of Europe, parts of uh, the Middle East, and uh, you know, one region in Africa, and even some parts of South America. And so where you get a comet shattering like that, it generates multiple air burst effects in multiple regions. Not globally, but you would see these uh, big air burst effects. And uh, they end the paper by pointing out that the, the fact that these microspherals and nanodiamonds are so widely distributed uh, tells us this is a fairly big comet that shattered, and, uh, but if you get these all these air bursts, it wouldn't necessarily leave behind any craters. So I said this would explain why we don't have a crater from the event, but we have an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence telling us uh, that there was an impact event. The platinum, uh, the iridium signatures, again, show up at all 50 sites, as well as these microspherals. They actually calculated, based on the studies they did in New Jersey, and in uh, Maryland and South Carolina, that the temperature generated uh, by the air bursts was running between 1,000, well, let me see, between 1,250 and 3,053 degrees centigrade. So that's hot enough uh, to melt iron. And indeed, they actually show evidence of melted iron in these uh, microspherals. Uh, and that high temperature would have ignited forests and grass fires in all these different parts of the world. Uh, the blast effect uh, would have been significant, and it would have had the biggest impact on the big animals. And so they're actually claiming in the paper, we think this was the cause of the extinction of the woolly mammoths. Uh, the woolly mammoths would have been inhabiting Europe and Siberia and the Canada, uh, where the greatest impact uh, from this shattered comet was taking place. Uh, a few woolly mammoths may have survived, but not enough to prevent the extinction of these uh, woolly mammoths. And also it explained the initiation of cooling uh, because those forests and grass fires would have caused aerosols to go into the atmosphere, which would have blocked out the sunlight. Uh, but also that uh, the, these air bursts had a major impact on Lake Agassiz actually changing the flow of Lake Agassiz uh, from down into the Gulf of Mexico and instead out into the Arctic and into the North Atlantic uh, through the St. Lawrence and Mackenzie Rivers. And so I would explain why the cooling 
lasted 1,200 years. So the exciting thing here is that we, I think we finally have got an answer for what is the cause and the maintenance of the younger uh, driest cooling event, what caused it and what sustained it for 1,200 years, and actually eliminates the dispute that's been going on about this impact event in northwest Greenland. Uh, yes, it could be quite ancient, 58 million years ago, but a second impact that was focused on, uh, you know, say, Baffin Island and uh, uh, Greenland would explain why we have so much evidence uh, for these uh, an impact event that dates just to 12,800 years ago in the same region. So this debate over what do we trust, the young dates or the old dates has been resolved. We trust them both. We're talking two impact events, and we now really do have an understanding for this younger, driest cooling event. But as I mentioned in weathering climate change, uh, this impact has to be extraordinarily fine-tuned in order to explain the nature of the younger, driest cooling event and how it initiated this extended period of extreme climate stability, unprecedented climate stability. So I mentioned in the book, Weathering Climate Change, climate instability is the norm for planet Earth. The exception is extreme climate stability. And because of that, we humans have been able to multiply up in the billions and develop the civilization we need to take the good news of salvation uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, so feel free to uh, put comments. I do read the comments and respond to them. And uh, so thank you for watching.